Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Dana Harris, uh, Vice President of Federal and State Advocacy with the Austin Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank all of you for joining us today uh, for the review of the AIA. And one special piece of the AIA created um, regional USPTO offices around the country. And one of them, as we all know, is in Dallas. And we're fortunate enough to have the director here. And she's going to speak a little bit about that office and its vision and also talk about the AIA. Um, next, I want to thank our hosts, the Austin IPLA, Dell, Hull CPC, Hoosh Blackwell, University of Texas System, Office of Innovation and Strategic Investment, Texas State Star Park, University of Texas at Austin, Office of Technology and Commercialization, and the Toller Law Group. And we also want to thank Google for providing the space here today. And I also want to recognize one special individual. We have Sandy Edwards from Senator John Cornyn's office with us. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Brian Nash, who's the Master of Ceremonies today. He's a registered patent attorney and counsel in Pillsbury's intellectual property practice. Mr. Nash's practice includes patent and intellectual property litigation and counseling. He previously served as law clerk to Judge Richard Lynn of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. He is the president of the Austin Intellectual Property Law Association, and he attended the University of Texas School of Law. So with that, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And what you probably can guess uh, with an event this large and wonderful it takes a lot of planning and hard work, and Dana has been instrumental in leading that effort. So I think once again, let's thank Dana for what an awesome job this, uh, she put in. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here today. We live in very interesting and exciting times. The AIA, American Advance Act, is probably the most important patent legislation that's been passed since the 1952 Patent Act. Uh, it did two very important things. It moved us from a first inventor system to a first inventor to file system. And it also introduced some very important and innovative post-grant procedures that are helping to shape how patents are valued going forward. And we're seeing how that's having effects in district court litigation, in patent office proceedings, and how it's shaping the industry and innovation as things move forward. So while it's been five years since it was enacted, many of the provisions took some time to fully get implemented. And we're just now seeing how those provisions are playing out. We're in the thick of it. So we look back uh, at this five-year mark uh, because it's just now that we're going to be moving on to some of the landmark decisions that are going to be setting the stage for how the next 40, 50 years worth of patent uh, legislation plays out. The U.S., uh, by enacting the AIA, has set itself up as one of the global leaders in intellectual property. And so the world's going to be looking to us as we move forward and um, start digging in with how these provisions are being implemented. Um, today we have a very exciting and interesting program. We're going to be hearing from two very important legislators that have worked tirelessly on the AIA and are continuing to work on intellectual property legislation as we speak. Um, those messages are from Senator Cornyn and Representative Smith. So we'll be playing those videos in a moment, and those are going to be very interesting. Um, we'll then hear from Hope Shimabuku, the regional director of the Texas Regional Office of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. She's going to be talking about achievements, plans, and vision of the Texas Regional Office. And then we're going to have a very cool panel discussion. Has the AIA met its promises, and what's the road ahead? And our panelists are going to include Judge Yackel, Bill Holsley, Anthony Peterman, Steve Frazier, and Hope Shimabuku. So with that, 
I'd like to start a couple videos here. First, we'll hear from John, uh, Senator Cornyn and then Representative Smith. Hi, I'm Texas Senator John Cornyn. Taking a look back on the last five years of patent reform is an important step to continue moving forward, and I want to thank the Chamber for allowing me to say just a few words. Texas innovators are the engines of job growth, yet too often frivolous and costly patent litigation holds them back. While we've been able to pass patent modernization legislation and bring a regional U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to Texas, there's still a lot of work yet to be done. That's why I've introduced the Patent Act, which discourages false infringement claims and gives defendants a fair chance. I'll continue to keep you apprised as we move forward with this legislation, and as always, I appreciate your input. Keep up the great work and enjoy your lunch. I wish I was there with you all and so many IP experts, but the House is in session this week, so I'm stuck in Washington. I had the opportunity to speak with chamber members this summer when they traveled to the Capitol to discuss issues important to the Austin area, including patent reform. Patent reform is a subject I have been interested in for a long time. It's hard to believe that the America Invents Act was six years in the making and was enacted five years ago. The patent system was long overdue for changes, especially if it was going to stay on pace with all the great initiatives coming out of the Austin area. Texas innovators come up with new products and solutions, and with those come more patent applications. With our strong high-tech sector and other advanced industries, patents issued to Texans have more than doubled over the past two decades and hundreds of thousands of Texas jobs have been created thanks to the individuals and companies that hold those patents. Patent reform was much needed to protect our investments in these vibrant industries and the intellectual property that was created. That's what Senator Patrick Leahy and I set out to do with our patent reform bill. It became the first significant reform to our patent system in 60 years. There was a major need for modernization the patent law on the books before AIA was written was pre-cable, pre-internet, and pre-cell phones. The new law has helped the Patent and Trademark Office reduce the backlog of patent applications, created a review system to eliminate questionable patents that should have never been granted in the first place, and reformed court procedures to limit abusive patent litigation. Updates to the U.S. patent system were also needed to harmonize our system with the global patent framework. The America Invents Act makes it easier for small inventors to use their patent applications abroad and to protect their invention in the global marketplace. The AIA also required the establishment of three or more satellite offices of the Patent and Trademark Office. Not surprisingly, we have an office here in Texas to serve our innovators. The Dallas office and the others in Silicon Valley, Denver, and Detroit play a critical role in more closely connecting patent filers with the United States Patent and Trademark Office and improving the speed and quality of patent examination. The AIA shows how bipartisan, bicameral legislation in Congress can address important problems and arrive at sound solutions. Still, we must continue to work together to curb activist courts and to rein in frivolous patent litigation that stifles job growth. But I hope and believe that the America Invents Act has improved the quality of patents and ensured America's role as the world leader in innovation. Those were great messages. I think I, I, we really appreciate uh, getting the opportunity to hear from them. Um, I think it just further reinforces that all great things can be traced back to Texas in some way. So um, it's now my honor and privilege to introduce Hope Shimabuku. Hope is the director of the Texas Regional United States Patent and Trademark Office, which you just heard about from Representative Smith. Um, Prior to taking that role, she was the Vice President and Corporate Counsel at Xerox Corporation, and before that, she was at uh, BlackBerry Corporation. She also worked as an engineer at Procter & Gamble and at Dell Computer. Uh, she is a leader and has been a leader in the Texas region. She is 
the chair of the State Bar of Texas's intellectual property section. She is in the Barbara Lynn IP Inn of Court. She is a previous past president of the Dallas Asian American Bar Association, chaired the Dallas Diversity Task Force, served on the board of the Dallas Bar Association, and many other roles, which would take a while for me to list here. But she's currently continuing to be involved in some very important pro bono initiatives, and we will hear about those later today. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage Hope Shimabuku. Thank you, Brian, for that fantastic welcome, and I am extraordinarily happy to be here. Thank you, Bill Holsley, the brainchild for this particular event, as well as Dana Harris and the rest of the planning committee. Haven't they done a fantastic job? Let's give them a hand. Okay. I am thrilled to be here to celebrate the fifth birthday of the America Invents Act. That's the act that enabled the establishment of the Texas Regional Office and, frankly, my job. And the reason that I'm here um, now working for the federal government. I know that the intent of this talk is to focus specifically on the Texas Regional Office and the goals and purposes of that office, but I don't want to brush aside the significance of this anniversary and some of the milestones that the USPTO has achieved as a result of the AIA. Let me talk implementation a little bit purely by the numbers. As a result of the AIA, we have implemented four programs, 20 provisions of law, four memoranda, 26 public education sessions, seven studies, 31 federal register notices, and 791 public comments have been received. We've harmonized the US patent law with the rest of the world, and we created the four new regional offices as Representative um, Lee, uh, excuse me, Smith had just mentioned. We've created new patent trial and appeal boards and three new post-grant proceedings providing faster and lower cost alternatives to district court litigation on the issue of patent validity. We've expanded the board to a current total of more than 270 judges, an increase of 172 since AIA was signed into law. And to date, we have around 5,500 AIA petitions that have been filed, more than what we have expected. Despite the higher workload, we have met every single statutory deadline. And the vast majority of the PTAB rulings have been affirmed by the courts of appeals for the federal circuit. We've collaborated with bar organizations and law schools across the country to provide patent pro bono assistance for under-resourced investors and small businesses in all 50 states. And we've granted the USPTO fee setting authority that has allowed the agency to continue working through government shutdowns and to create an enhanced patent quality initiative resulting in system-wide changes and new examiner training. We've created prioritized track one examination options with more than 39,000 filings to date and resulting in final disposition within 12 months. With respect to the Texas Regional Office in particular and the regional offices, they were actually designed for three purposes. One was to recruit and retain a highly qualified workforce. So the Texas Regional Office will eventually have 100 to 140 to 150 total employees. 110 of them will be patent examiners and we currently have 14 judges. As of today, we had a new class of 25 examiners start, bringing our total of total examiners in our office to 81. So about 75 of them are brand new examiners, with six of them being transfer or experienced examiners. Each of our examiners go through four months of training in class before they move up into our offices. And then um, our last class will actually start in January of this year. Now, when we're talking about hiring highly qualified workforce, let me give you a couple of numbers. For our first two classes of 50 examiners, we had 800 applicants. At that time, statistically, it was harder to work for the Texas Regional Office than it was to get into Harvard Law School. 
for our third class that actually started today, for 25 spots, we had 1,250 exam, uh, people apply to be an examiner in our office. That is an amazing number of applicants, and we have an extremely talented, highly qualified pool of applicants. A number of them actually are attorneys that are working in our office as well, some of them very experienced, having 10 or more years of patent prosecution experience coming to work for us. Um, we have, um, for the second reason our office is there, we are making our services more accessible to those working outside of our nation's capital. I won't go over a lot of our services in detail, as I know a number of you have accessed our services already. We have examiner interview rooms, allowing you to meet face-to-face -face with the examiners that are on site, or to um, WebEx in and having a video conference with any examiner around the country. We have hearing rooms in which you can come and have live oral hearings in front of our PTAB judges. We have search rooms and we have um, conference rooms as well that are accessible. And uh, before I continue, I want to give a shout out to some of my fellow colleagues. Um, Deborah, who is here as well, she is one of our PTAB judges. And Jacob and Taylor are two examiners from my office. And so these are part of the Texas Regional Office and um, they are here um, to support this event. The third reason for the Texas Regional Office is to serve as um, IP outreach and education effort hubs and to provide inventors and entrepreneurs easier access to USPTO personnel and resources. And this is actually what I spend about 60 to 70% of my time doing because this is an integral part of the regional office and the region, reason why we have the regional office. To date, we have hit every single state within my region with some sort of outreach event. So my region covers eight states. It covers Texas, the surrounding states, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Alabama. And we've held a number of different events in each of the states. Now, when we're looking at the different events, we look at six different stakeholders, and I put them in buckets of different stakeholders. The first stakeholder that we have is the K through 12 um, stakeholder, in which we are invigorating and encouraging students to get into a STEM-related um, career. We go into the schools, we have STEM activities. So for example, they, we go in, we split the, team, uh, the classroom into teams, and then we ask them to invent something. They have to fix a problem. We do this both with the students as well as the teachers. One of the events that I went to was out in El Paso, and we had a group of teachers um, break out. They had to list something that they wanted to solve. And one team of teachers, classic teacher problem, decided that they wanted to solve the issue of kids coming in from recess and being stinky. All right, classic teacher problem that they wanted to resolve. And so what they did, the solution that they came up with was they developed a nasal strip that they would put on their nose and then they would scent the nasal strip with lavender or some other scent that they wanted to smell. So it doesn't fix the issue. The kids are still stinky, but they are not smelling the kids at that time. And so these are the t some of the activities that we do with our K through 12 teams. We also have had Girl Scouts come on site to do an IP patch activity. We work with the YMCA on their thingamajig program. So those are some of the K through 12 programs that we do. We also work with universities. And I know that Betsy is here in the audience somewhere. And I know that we work with the different tech transfer offices, working with them on educating their professors as well as their, mostly their graduate students and helping them be able to understand the importance of having patent and trademark or any other IP bucket protection for their ideas that they're researching on currently right now. We also go into the classroom of the different um, universities and we talk to them about the importance and educating them on the importance of IP. The third group we talk to a lot is with companies. And so we do a lot of visits with companies. My team was just recently at Fujitsu, and we would go there and we would not only visit the site, but we're interacting with the different executives and the different IP teams, talking to them about the issues that they have with the patent system, with the trademark system, what we can do to improve, talking to them about different concerns that they might have, and what else we can do to make sure that their patents get processed faster, more efficiently, with higher quality. 
The, uh, another group that we work with, and a number of you are represented here, is lawyers. And so we also talk to you, one, some of our main clients and stakeholders who interact with us on a day-to-day -day basis. We do work with you on a day-to-day -day basis and want to talk to you, give you um, not only our insights for, in particular, like Alice, and how we train our examiners, how we've developed that guidance. We've talked to a number of lawyers about that recently and also interacted with them and let them know about how our examiners examine patents, giving them insight into those different things. Um, the last, uh, another group that we talked to is small businesses, independent inventors, and entrepreneurs. Did you know that the Rio Grande Valley actually only has two IP attorneys? And so when we're rich in IP attorneys in Dallas, Austin, and um, Houston, and we look at the Rio Grande Valley, it's hard for us to fathom that they only have two IP attorneys. So some of the things that we're doing um, within our office is going down to help support them, to help support the base, because there is a lot of entrepreneur activity that is happening down there. And so we are down there um, setting up and planning to have patent and trademark education seminars. Some of them are going to be 101. Some of them um, are fairly well educated on patent and trademark, so we'll go into a more advanced course as well. Um, we have done similar courses in El Paso, San Antonio, and New Orleans, and we are actually also starting our first Spanish-only patent and trademark seminar. So we're going to be giving that completely in Spanish. We're going to do that in November. We're going to bring that down in the Rio Grande Valley. I'm also hoping that we can bring it here in Austin as well to hit that market because I know there's a significant market for that. The last group of stakeholders that we work with is our congressmen and congresswomen. They do actually have a number of different events. Some of them, like Congressman Richmond in New Orleans, we were down there supporting their small business expo that they had. We also had Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson come to our office and hold a reception associated with the App Challenge and the participants of that App Challenge. So what does that mean for Austin, and how does that impact you for Austin? We've been in Austin actually quite a few times, and this afternoon we will be in the different workspaces that you have here. So myself, Taylor, and Jacob, we're going to actually be hitting um, the three workspaces, Galvanize, uh, WeWorks, as well as Capital Factory, and we're going to be holding one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. Austin is a valuable, important partner for the USPTO. On average, I know that Austin generates about 1,050 patents. The top three technology areas in the state of Texas are well patents, synthetic resins and natural rubbers, and semiconductor device manufacturing. And the third category, at least in that area, I know could not have happened without the businesses and the industry here in Austin, and they are a major contributor to the number of patents that we get in the Texas area. We will be here um, more throughout the year. I'm going to be here at the Women in STEM Game Changer event. I'll be here for the AIPLA, uh, not AIPLA, excuse me, Advanced Patent Law Institute, as well as we're going to be holding an EPQI event, specifically here on November 16th. The other events that I think that would be, um, and services that would be very beneficial to Austin is I'm going to try to encourage the UT Law School to have a patent and trademark clinic. It is the number one law school in the state of Texas, and they do not have a patent and trademark clinic. And we have just opened up our application process for having patent and trademark clinics. I think the community could benefit from having such a clinic, and so that's one of the things that I really want to encourage. The other thing is, and you'll hear more about this from Bill Holsey, is really energizing the pro bono organizations here. So um, our office has partnered with TALA, the Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts, and um, they are the organization providing pro bono services to the community across Texas as well as Louisiana for those who cannot financially afford um, a patent or a trademark. Um, as I mentioned, I want to do patent and trademark seminars, um, especially a Spanish one. And then we want to potentially put in a speed dating with startup session. The government actually has a lot of resources that we have. We, uh, with the SBA, we have STTP and SBIR programs. We also have a number of different uh, working relationships with customs and import and export organizations. 
And so we want to be able to have those resources, make them available, let the community know that these are different resources that the government has to be able to provide to help their companies be able to grow and expand um, their products, not only within the country, but nationwide as well as outside of the country as well. So these are the main um, points that I have for today. I know I'm going to open it up for Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, there will be someone who has a microphone walking around, and this session is actually being recorded. So if you don't mind, if you have a question, please speak into the microphone, and that way they can record it and hear it, because otherwise they won't be able to hear it um, on the recording. All right, any questions? Wow, I have never been so complete. <laughs> does, the, uh, does the patent office have a target for how many examiners you'd like to have eventually in each of the regional, uh, regional offices? Yes, so the majority of the hiring right now is only within the regional offices. We do have some hiring in headquarters, but the lion's share of the hiring right now is in the regional offices. So for the Texas, Denver, and Detroit office, the goal is to have 100 brand new patent examiners. For the Silicon Valley office, Silicon Valley not having as much room, they are expected to have about 80 brand new patent examiners. For the Detroit and the Denver office, they have hit their peak. They have hit 100. And so for Detroit, they are in the second round of hiring. So 50% of our workforce teleworks. And so you have to be in the office for two years and then get up to a GS-12 grade level. And once you meet that criteria, you are eligible for telework. So the Detroit office has seen their first couple of classes go off and telework, and so they are in the process of hiring again. Denver just had um, their round of examiners go off and telework last month. So they are looking to hire and um, another class of examiners coming up soon as well. What have been some of the biggest advantages to the small inventor as a result of AIA? So for the small inventor for the AIA, I think it's really the access um, to the resources and the outreach education um, that they've been able to receive. So the outreach teams, like for example my team, we've been able to go out and put on the patent and trademark seminars. There have been a number of times that we've gone out and we've just talked about patent and trademarks, what we do, what are they. It's something um, that's not just a name that you hear on Shark Tank on Friday nights, right, that you might think about getting. And the comments that we've received back is, I have never had a presentation like this ever. And so I think that it's really educating them and arming them with information. It helps our attorneys, at least I would like to think it would help our attorneys, because what we do is we let them know that this is what your attorney needs as well. When they are representing you, um, the best thing that you could do is to provide um, as much information as possible, because they are you are the experts, and the more information that they can glean from you, the better application that they can get. So we um, let them know about that. The other thing is that we let them know about the different resources that USPTO has. So like the partnerships that we have um, with Tala for the pro bono resources, we actually also have an inventor assistance center and a trademark assistance center. So if inventors or independent uh, or small entrepreneurs decide to go it alone and go pro se and not be represented, um, they can call this 1-800 number, it's a customer service line, and they can receive help on preparing their application. Now, because we can't give legal advice, we can help you put together the application, but we can't answer the critical questions like, is this what you should be including in your patent application? Is this the most novel piece of the um, invention that you have? So those questions that are typically asked um, by an attorney, we can't answer those. But we can help you um, through the process and give you the different steps on and the different components that you need to file your application. You've talked a little bit about uh, hiring of examiners for the Dallas office. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the hiring of PTAB judges uh, and sort of where that fits in the regional scheme? Sure. 
So um, PTAB judges, the majority of our PTAB, uh, so to qualify as a PTAB judge, you have to have at least 10 years of experience as an attorney in this particular area of law, so patent law. And so the majority of our PTAB judges that we've hired actually in our office has over 20 years of experience. And so 20 years, a lot of them have um, a variety of different transactional as well as litigation experience and prosecution experience as well, a good mixture. And so um, I've never gone through the actual hiring of the PTAB um, hiring, but my understanding is that after you submit your application, after you get to a certain point in the actual interview process, then you actually have to go and um, provide an oral argument, right? Is that right? And so you go up to Alexandria, you do your oral argument before the current PTAB um, judges that we have sitting, and then you um, present your case, and that's part of the interview process. Now, um, we are currently closed on hiring for PTAB judges. We have hired, um, we've tripled our size in the last couple of years as far as PTAB judges. So right now, we're kind of letting it settle down. Um, we're onboarding our new PTAB judges. That, does, that doesn't mean that we aren't gonna be hiring in the near future, it's just for right now, we're kind of letting the dust settle and let our new judges get settled in um, so that we can see where we're at for right now. Did that answer your question? Okay. As a, um, I'm sorry. As a tech company, what would be the best way for us to engage with you guys on a kind of policy and procedure level? So as a tech company, one of the things that we are very interested in is understanding the technology roadmap that you are going on. And so we have this program called PETTP. Don't ask me what it stands for because I forgot. Um, but we have um, the ability to be able to have all of our examiners within that particular art unit or tech center be able to all get on a conference call or WebEx together and to be educated on um, your technology. Because our examiners, I mean, you know that they're only looking at that very small piece of whatever is in that application. And so sometimes it's hard for them to see the bigger picture of where you're going, how does this particular technology or this particular patent application fits into the bigger picture. Um, so we really encourage tech companies to come and educate our examiners and to let them know where they're going. It really helps them be a better examiner at the end of the day, and it allows them to examine um, patents with a bigger viewpoint. So that's one of the best ways. The other way to engage us is to reach out to us because we would love to come out and visit with you um, if there's particular concerns that you have. I know Alice is a big topic, all right? And so we've gone out to a number of different companies and we've just had round tables with them, with our, um, some of our examiners. We've brought in folks from, um, which we'll dial in from Alexandria, the ones who actually created the guidance. We will bring them in and to give insight into Alice and some of the things that we've been teaching our examiners. So th those are a number of different ways that you can engage with us. So, all right, I think, um, what do you wanna do? One more question. Okay, last question, sorry. This might be a little bit of an organization question, but we have the satellite offices, the hoteling examiners, and the patent depositories or repositories. I worked at one doing some searching um, for our law firm back in 1990 in Silicon Valley. I just read that a new one has opened in Las Cruces, I believe. How, why does the patent office need these and how do they relate to the satellite offices? Okay, excellent question from one of our former examiners. <laughs> so um, this week actually on uh, Wednesday, we are opening up what we call a patent and trademark resource center um, in Las Cruces. We've partnered with 80 different libraries around the country and, um, and they have set up what's called a PTRC. 
And what a PTRC is, is they have one of our computer terminals in their library. That computer terminal is loaded with the software that our examiners use to do searches, as well as the trademark examiners um, that has their software to do searches as well. So what the PTRCs do is they allow people to be able to go closer versus going to the regional offices, because each of the regional offices also have those computer terminals as well. But it allows people to go there and do their searches. And um, I know that there's a lot of patents out there. We issued our nine millionth patent application out there. Uh, excuse me, we issued our nine millionth patent. We granted it last year. And so what this does is um, people can come and use that tool, do a search, and um, it'll be a, highly, a higher likelihood that you're going to find the same prior art that our examiners are finding versus just doing a general Google search because you're using the same tools as our examiner is using. They're pulling from the same databases that our examiners are pulling from. And so that's really what it is. The librarians have been trained um, on IP. And they've also been trained on how to use our systems as well, so they are on site to be able to provide a resource. But that is how they relate. Now the difference is, is it's not a full-fledged office. All right, they don't have examiners, they don't have judges that are sitting there. So each of the regional offices, we are staffed with about 140 to 150 people, except for Silicon Valley. And we do have judges and examiners that are on site. So the PTRCs are only staffed with the librarians that we have, um, that we have trained. All right. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank Appreciate you. It. Rest assured you will get to hear more from Hope in just a moment because we have an excellent panel coming up. And uh, we are very lucky to have Hope as the, re as the director of the regional office. Uh, it's the Texas regional office, and she's made a big point of that. She's been to Austin multiple times since she took that position. Um, so in fact, I think she may be here just as much as she's in Dallas or anywhere else. So we're very lucky to have her. Thanks again, Hope. Appreciate it. I'd like to introduce our moderator, and uh, he will be introducing the panel. Our moderator today is Gary Hoover. Gary is a serial entrepreneur. He's started a number of companies, and they've all been very interesting, exciting, and some have been incredibly successful. One of those was Bookstop, which at the time of its acquisition by Barnes & Noble was the fourth largest book superstore in the country. Another was the Reference Press, which later became Hoover's reference materials. I'm sure many of you have used Hoover's to look up corporate information before. Gary Hoover is the Hoover's in Hoover's. Uh, he is the CEO of Big Wig Games. He is the entrepreneur in residence at the University of Texas at Austin School of Information. And he was the first entrepreneur in re of residence at the McComb School of Business when they started that position. He studied and received a degree in economics from the University of Chicago, where, interestingly, he studied under four professors who later ended up becoming Nobel Prize winning um, economists, including Milton Friedman. I, I don't know if there's a relationship there, but I kind of want to have some relationship with Gary, too, so that I can maybe win a prize someday. Um, he teaches courses in entrepreneurial thinking, and in fact, his newest course is starting tomorrow. If you're interested in that, pull Gary aside today or go to hoobersworld.com. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Gary Hoover. Uh, thank you, Brian. It's uh, great to be here. I haven't had a lot to do with um, intellectual property except a lot of copyrights and trademarks in my life and maybe some trade secrets but I advise uh, thousands of uh, entrepreneurs and mentor thousands of entrepreneurs in the 45 countries I've been to, so the more I know, the better. Uh, if the panel can come on up, I'll uh, introduce the panel. Um, let me sit here. Uh, so, I'll just start on your left, 
the first gentleman is Steve Fraser. And Steve has spent 30 years uh, working on uh, innovation strategy. He was up in uh, Nebraska and ran a big uh, incubator up there. He, uh, he now runs the Star Park at the uh, Texas State University in San Marcos. It's a 58-acre fa facility. It's differentiated. Last I counted, there are 46 incubators and co-working spaces in Austin. It's differentiated because it has um, chemistry, life science, and materials labs, uh, which uh, people can really use um, uh, at Star Park in San Marcos. So a real asset addition to the Austin community and the whole Central Texas community. And Steve's on the board of directors of the Association of University Research Parks. Uh, next is Judge Lee Yackel. Uh, uh, the judge uh, got uh, both BA and JD at uh, University of Texas Law School, hook em horns, and uh, two to one uh, so far this year, so it's beats last year anyway. Uh, and uh, the judge was appointed to the Third, Circuit, uh, Third Court of Appeals in 1998 by Governor Bush. He became a U.S. District Judge in 2003 in the West uh, Western District of Texas, the Austin Division. In 2012, he received the Samuel Pissarra Award for Outstanding Jurist, presented by the Texas Bar Foundation. And it's a real testament to uh, Judge Akel's commitment to the intellectual property community that the Inn of Court here in Austin is actually named uh, the Judge uh, Lee Akel uh, Inn of Court. So that uh, says a lot. Next, Bill Holsey. I don't know if it really Bill needs much of an introduction. Rhodes College, Vanderbilt Law School. I think the Longhorns are probably a little stronger than Vandy this year. Uh, and uh, founded Holsey uh, PSPC, uh, uh, our local IP law firm with offices here and in Memphis. Uh, he is a uh, fellow of the IC Squared Institute at UT, which, as you know, is really involved in technology uh, commercialization. I'm a, a fellow fellow there, too. It's a great uh, Institute, if you don't know much about it. Um, his commitment is really proven uh, in, in that uh, Holsey PC has been a leading factor in the pro bono work, uh, the pro bono program that was established by the AIA five years ago. And uh, they've been very active in that. So that's a key thing. The other thing that I did not know until preparing for this is that Bill sings classical choral works uh, apparently around the world this June he and a bunch of Texans sang at the Vatican. So that may uh, put him on a separate pedestal from the rest of us here. Um, and uh, next on, uh, down the row, Anthony Peterman, uh, 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 BS at UT, uh, JD at uh, SMU. After a career at Baker and Botts, he joined Dell in 1998. He became chief patent counsel in 2009. And today, he's vice president of intellectual property at Dell. Uh, overseeing the Dell server, networking, and end-user uh, business units. And you already know Hope, so um, that's, I think that covers everybody. Everybody got your microphones working? Good. Uh, I just, I'll just stay with this one, and that way everybody has, has a mic over there. So I've got some questions here, and uh, maybe we'll have some time to take some questions from the audience. Uh, so let me start with uh, Bill Holsey. Do you believe that the AIA has helped give entrepreneurs the confidence they need to attract investments, grow their businesses, and hire more workers? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I don't know that it, that's 100% true. I know that there have been some substantial changes. Changes, and I think one way to characterize it uh, is that the relationship between our clients, our inventors, has had the opportunity and our inventors have taken it to become much more involved and much closely, much more closely related to the examiners who are examining their cases, uh, understanding where they are in the process, the ability to manage the advancement of their cases through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office such as the use of track one filing, which seeks and oftentimes generally does succeed in getting you a disposition or a conclusion as to whether your application is allowable within one year. I can recall years ago, long before the AIA, when I asked a client 
our client asked me how long it would be before his case was examined, and we'd already been three years into it. Because of the backlog, the answer came back, it'd be 11 years before his application was answered, uh, was, was examined. To me, that was, that was unacceptable. Those days are gone. Uh, the concept of compact prosecution is a reality. And I think, as Hope indicated, the demeanor of the Patent and Trademark Office, I think, has fundamentally changed, not only because of the AIA, but around all of that is the relationship, the openness, the uh, encouragement, the outreach that the Patent Office has done has been part, part of the AIA, uh, part of the AIA and the efforts associated with, with the AIA. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out, and that is that I'm very proud of the Dallas office, um, but at, I think it's a good idea for you to also, whenever you have an opportunity, go to Alexandria. Go see the patent office. They have the National Inventors Hall of Fame there. Uh, it is, it's an American treasure. I would submit that perhaps except for the European patent office, and probably not, I'd say we have the best patent office in America. And if you're an intellectual property stakeholder, I think it's a great idea. Go to the, go to the Hall of Fame, go to the exhibits. They have uh, continuing exhibits on education uh, at, at the PTO. The, um, in addition to that, some of the examples of PTO leadership that I've seen since the enactment of the AIA have been the way that the leadership has interacted with Austin. I think Michelle Lee has worked her way into, uh, if she wants it, a permanent casting at the South by Southwest agenda. She became the director of the Patent Office uh, in 2014. She was sworn in at South by Southwest. I think she had at least four or five venues this last year, which she was part, part of South by Southwest. Um, another thing that I think has been part of the AIA events has been this concept of globalization of the patent office and the ability for our clients to, for inventors, to get to a global patent much more quickly than they used to be able to do. One of the fundamental efforts has been the patent prosecution highway. Now that's not part of the American Invents Act, but it's all associated and all part of the system. So I would say, by and large, not only by the AIA, but also just the way that the Patent Office has operated and tried to engage. Not all applications are going to be allowed. Of the good ones, uh, the, the ones that do, in fact, claim novel and non-obvious statutory subject matter will be allowed, but the ability to get to that decision, I think, has been more effective as a result of the AIA. Uh, great, thanks, Bill. I'm going to have to get up to that uh, uh, Inventors Hall of Fame. That sounds like my kind of thing. Uh, Judge Akel, I'll put you up next. Uh, how has the AIA benefited district court practice? Well, let me start with a disclaimer I must give. I'm sitting here today speaking only for myself. I don't speak for the judiciary of the United States, uh, and I don't speak for any other judges either in Austin or in the Western District of Texas or anywhere other than myself. Uh, having said that, uh, the AIA as a whole has not benefited the district courts, in my opinion. Now, the reason for the disclaimer is that we have 679 active United States district judges in this country when all the positions are filled. Uh, we currently have some vacant positions. Uh, but the district courts of this country don't make policy. The Congress of the United States and the President of the United States makes policy, and then it's up to the courts uh, to do our best to follow the policy along. The courts are very seldom consulted uh, by the Congress of the United States uh, in establishing the policy, the policy that was established in the AIA. I'm not being negative to the AIA, but we did not have a large role in the AIA, and if we did, it wouldn't have mattered because each of those 679 different judges have different dockets, different size of dockets, different case makeup on their dockets, and I will submit to you it's impossible to come up with an across-the-board statute in any, of the, any area of the law, much less the intellectual property area, that is going to work 
the same way across each judge's uh, docket. So what we do, uh, all of your district judges, is we look at what the Congress does and what the President signs, and then we have to figure out how best we're going to work that in to the docket we have, because every district judge uh, is going to be restricted by time constraints. In Austin, Texas, out of those 679 dockets, and they weight the docket, patent cases get a high number on a weighted scale because they're a lot more complex and require a lot more care and feeding than your average case. Uh, and then it classes all the way down. Well, on the weighted average, uh, Judge Sparks, who's the other full-time district judge in Austin and I, consistently have two of the top five weighted dockets in the country. So understand that a lot is going on in Austin uh, in, in the intellectual property area and in other areas. And so everything we do and everything every one of those 679 judges does has got to in some way fit in to docket management and how they're going to handle uh, their cases. Uh, so the short story is the America Invents Act is just an addition on to what was existing patent law at that time. And from a trial judge's point of view, I have just reacted to it and tried to work the new areas of it into the way I handle cases in general and patent cases in particular. But I can't go so far as to say it has been a help uh, to the courts. Uh, it has been a help to other people that have an interest and other entities that have an interest in intellectual property law, but it did not have a, a lot in it uh, for the courts and the way you administer your docket. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Steve Fraser, I'm going to go to you next. Um, how do startup and emerging growth companies approach IP strategies today compared with 10 years ago? I have to uh, also throw in a disclaimer in that I'm not actually running a company. My job is to provide an environment and a set of assets that allow companies to grow. And so my observations are, from someone who pro provides programmatic support, what are the impacts that I see? First and foremost is that there's a better understanding that the management of intellectual property is, is something that is strategic and systematic. It's no longer this... Uh, esoteric sort of act, set of activities that you wait for the last minute to have to pay someone like Bill to help you uh, to accomplish. The second is that with the emergence of new crowdsourcing funding, especially for philanthropic giving, for research activities, and for raising of equity, it's raised the need for a greater set of educational programming and awareness so that people understand what it is they're uh, engaging in beyond the raising of capital. Folks have always understood the use of, of NDAs, uh, increasingly MTAs, and the insertion of work for higher provisions for their employees. But this has allowed us to reintroduce those conversations. Alignment with the rest of the world has had dramatic impact. We've been in operation for about three years. We've already had one company enter into a $20 million joint venture activity in China. And part of their uh, feeling secure in doing that was understanding their ability to get proper protection for their intellectual property and be able to convey that and support it in China. Also, the Ombudsman's Office, we've already made uh, use of that to solve some problems for a couple of the companies that we have. So greater um, ability to access in a friendly manner um, the uh, USPTO. The other impact it has is on those of us who are providing those services. It has set up a separate set of expectations in terms of both facilities, facilities management, and then programmatic delivery. The day of the casual collision in the hallway is rapidly behind us, and the challenge that that creates is developing programming that's attractive and gets people to interact with each other to get that one value that's really important in an incubator. Some of you may have seen last week the uh, Austin Business Journal in a highly unscientific poll uh, asked their readers what would be the number one criteria for selection of an accelerator of co-working space. And the interesting return was 47% of respondents said it's the access to private space rather than co-working and, and co-mingling. 
In crowdfunding, one of the challenges that we face is dealing with the eagle, eager entrepreneur who misunderstands that the democratization of access to capital doesn't change the fundamental rules of intellectual property management. And so talking to someone who is eager to get their idea of their product uh, out in order to get uh, funding for it, that you need to have an appropriate level of disclosure and an appropriate level of protection before you enter into those enterprises. And finally, I would say that the presence of a regional office just does one thing that we all need, and that is better access. Better access to staff, better access to programs, better access to technical resources. So in the last five years, it's fundamentally changed, and I think ultimately for the good. Uh, great, thanks, Steve. Um, next, I'm gonna go to Anthony Peterman. Uh, how do you think that the post-grant procedures um, post-grant review, inter partes uh, review, and the uh, CBM uh, uh, business ideas uh, have played out over the last five years compared with the expectations? Because I know you worked hard to help make AIA happen. Yeah, so I think Lamar Smith said earlier that it was six years of legislative efforts before AIA was passed. So we, we had uh, worked on all six of those years, and uh, it's a, lot, a lot went into it. I think uh, one thing that's really interesting, there were two driving catalyst to, to why everybody was so interested. One was going to the first to file system and harmonizing with the rest of the world. The other was really litigation reform because um, there was a view that there were, there were some rules that needed to change. And really these, these post-grant procedures weren't the focus. Uh, they were in there and certainly part of the discussion, but I, as I remember it, not so much of the focus as the uh, you know, harmonization on first to file and then the litigation reform. Um, what's been interesting in the last five years is both the combination of the law plus the work of the Patent Office and how it set up all these procedures, hired great judges, really set up a process that's worked well. Is it is probably the most impactful part of the AIA has been the post-grant procedures. Um, IPR, so that's an inter-party inter, uh, review. If you don't know, I'm probably everybody here does, it's where you, you get to go before a panel of three judges and have a patent tested in the patent office. Uh, and sometimes that will pull it out of a litigation process. At, at Dell, we've had the experience where um, we've had, we had a lot of patents that were asserted against us that weren't well thought out at the time. The IPR procedure has really whittled that down. We have fewer, fewer issues, fewer lawsuits, more complex, because I think you know, the, the better patents are surviving now. Um, in terms of the CBM process, which later was sort of, is really a business method process, and like Alice has had some of the same impact on software patents. We've used it a little bit. It really has weeded out some of the worst candidates. The post-grant, where you would review a patent in the first, I think, nine months after it's granted, we haven't seen much use for that. It's typically later when a patent's asserted and, and it becomes more important between two parties. Um, but that's what I would say. say. So the expectations at the time, I think I know personally, I didn't expect a whole lot from any of the procedures. The one that preceded it, the inter-party re-exam, nobody used. The estoppel was bad. It took too long. You didn't have a panel of, of experienced judges. Uh, but once it got set up the right way and we started to see how it worked, it's, it's really had a great impact. Um, our new Dell Technologies entity that, that combines EMC and Dell, we have 20,000 patents and patent applications. So IP is super important for us. We want the right types of patents protected, and we still believe that's happening, even with some of the questions about the, uh, the post-grant procedures. Cool. Thanks, Anthony. And now I'll go back to Hope. Uh, there's been a lot of press about uh, patent quality, and I know the U.S. Patent Office has uh, uh, got several initiatives uh, to improve patent quality. Can you tell us about those? So, great question. Um, yeah, we've gotten a lot of press about, um, about patent quality and how patent quality is not good. And as a result, um, there are more patent trolls out there who are suing companies as a result of that. But um, I want to tell you that patent quality is extremely important for the USPTO. It is one of the biggest initiatives that our undersecretary has been focusing on. And so we have um, a group of initiatives in which we call EPQI. 
enhanced patent quality initiatives. And they focus on all aspects of patent prosecution from before patent um, prosecution, before you file the application to post-grant um, proceedings. And there is a number of different initiatives that we have. We have actually also included patent quality as a metric within each of our examiners' um, PAPs, as we call it, the performance reviews. And so our examiners are actually evaluated based on patent quality. There are very specific measures that they are evaluated against. And so a lot of those measures are indicated um, in what we call the master review form. So we've combined a number of different things that you might have heard um, in the past. For example, your search review. How well are they searching? First action um, on the merits review. Different things that are associated with the process of the patent review by an examiner are incorporated into what we call the master review form. And that master review form is what is used partially to be able to evaluate our examiners and how well that they are performing against the different patent quality measures. In addition to that, we have a number of different initiatives. One of the big initiatives that we have is educating our examiners on prior art that might have been introduced in a post-grant proceeding. So after our PTAB judges, um, after they evaluate a case, if there are certain prior art that they took into consideration or there's a certain analysis that they made um, with respect to uh, validity that they feel like is something that should be fed back to our patent examiners, there is a feedback loop. So the feedback loop goes back to that art unit or that tech center that originally evaluated that particular patent application, and they are given back feedback on what was different. What did our PTAB judges look at which was different than what was originally examined and reviewed? And so they look at that feedback and they incorporate it into their training as far as improving their patent quality that they look at. We have a number of other initiatives, um, and I won't go over some, all of them, but some of them um, include the initiative for if you're going to be doing um, an examiner interview. We do have IT support for um, that examiner interview, and so that they can set up the WebEx or whatever um, technology piece that you might need or technology questions. So we do have the support for that for those of you who do do examiner interviews and you're not coming on site. Or if you are coming on site and the examiner is not um, in our offices, we do have that initiative to improve the examiner interview process as well. Uh, great. Thank you, Hope. I think we're about right on schedule, so I don't think we have time for any uh, questions uh, now. Uh, but maybe you can catch these folks if you have more questions. I know our panel is uh, very busy, and it was uh, very generous of them all to take the time today, so let's give them a hand. And I'll turn it back over to Bill Holsey. First of all, thank you very much for attending. I think this was a great milestone in legislation that affects so many of us. One of the uh, things that has, has been a significant part of the AIA, as we, we mentioned, is the pro bono program. The pro bono program, I, I can remember back in 2011 before the AIA uh, started working with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, as the AIA was becoming uh, law and becoming effective, working with former Director Capos, uh, Chief Judge Randall Rader of the Federal Circuit, um, and, and others, we, we helped put this program in, in, in place. In, September, in August of last year, we had a great event to kick off the event. Craig Enoch, former Texas Supreme Court judge, and I have, and many others, many others, have, have been part of this program. I and he, he's, he wasn't able to attend today due to a, a, a court commitment, have put together the envelope that is at your seat. And I want to uh, point your direction to that, as well as introduce Alyssa McCain, who is the executive director of TALA, and Elizabeth Rogers, who's also one of the fundamental voices in TALA. If you could stand up, and that envelope has an incorrect address, 
And so Alyssa is going to tell you what the, what the address is, but thank you, Tala, uh, for, for taking this on. Alyssa, would you correct the address, please? Usually we're using a P.O. box, and that is the P.O. box number is 144722, and that's Austin 78714. It is on the bottom of our webpage on every page, and either Elizabeth or I will be happy if you just want to jot down your name and phone number information to take this today if you're interested in the pro bono program. So the pro bono program is something where corporate sponsors are needed. It's a self-funding program where educators can participate, students can participate, Patent agents can participate, attorneys can participate, any IP stakeholder is, is invited to be part of the program. As I was working with David Kapos uh, in, this, in this effort and getting it launched, he said, Bill, we need to make the patent system relevant to all inventors. And this is a fundamental milestone, this is a fundamental program to do that. So with that said, again, I want to thank Dana Harris for helping make this happen and applying the resources of the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, for the panelists, for Director Shimabuku, for Anthony Peterman and Judge Yakel and Gary Hoover and, and Steve Frazier, all the ones who have participated with this. This is your patent system and I thank you for participating at this time. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>